we are hosting a discussion at the Yemen Policy Center to discuss peacemaking under the Biden administration in light of the developments in Afghanistan and the takeover of Kabul by the Taliban. We're looking to paths to justice and peace in Yemen. As you all know, the latest recent move by President Biden administration was described by some, by some as chaotic. Meanwhile, celebrated and cheered by this. Uh, and President Biden made clear that this decision, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, isn't just about Afghanistan. It's about ending an era of major military operations to remake other countries. And since the Biden administration took office earlier this year, we saw so the development of this course, quote unquote, ending wounds. Uh, so today we'll look into the meaning of, of this discourse. Uh, what does the example of Afghanistan mean for Yemen and the broader region? Uh, what it means also for management and interaction with non-state actors and how peace is being pursued as the United States deepens its military engagement in Yemen, especially after the, appointed, the appointment of Timothy Linda King as a special envoy for Yemen. And, and with that, I uh, would like to welcome you today to this event, which is uh, funded by the German Federal Foreign Office, and will reflect with our guests uh, on these questions. Uh, today with us, first of all, is Barat Shaiban. Barat is a human rights activist and a researcher from the British human rights organization, the Reprieve, where, where he worked as the project coordinator in Yemen conducting field investigations into the US drone program. He was a former advisor to the Yemen Embassy in London, a youth delegate at the National Dialogue Conference, and a youth leader during the 2011 Arab Spring uprising. He continues to comment regularly on Yemeni politics in local, regional, and international media outlets. Glad to have you aboard, uh, Bar. Second is Adi al -Mutwakil. Adia is a human rights defender, the co-founder and chairperson of the Wafana Organization for Human Rights, an independent organization working to defend and protect human rights in Yemen as defined. Between 2000 and 2004, she worked for the National Commission for Women on Public Relations and Women's Participation in Political Processes. And in 2004, she began working on Yemeni human rights focused on the enforced disappearances and arbitrary arrests that took place during the Saada counterinsurgency war. Third is Peter Salisbury. Uh, glad to have you aboard earlier. Third is Peter Salisbury. Peter is the senior analyst for Yemen at the International Crisis Group, a research based conflict prevention and resolution NGO. He was previously a senior fellow at the Middle East and North Africa program at Chatham House. And he has more than 14 years of extensive experience as a print online and broadcast journalist, political economy researcher and analyst. Uh, Maha, for technical reason, will not be able to be with us. Welcome aboard, Peter, Ba, and Ravia. Uh, glad to have you aboard. Uh, before we get into the discussion, just a uh, quick house cleaning ground rules for our discussion today. Uh, to our audiences, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat. Uh, we'll have the first 45 minutes to have a discussion with our fellow panelists. Uh, we have guiding questions that will ask basically each one of the three panelists uh, attending today, and we'll take a spontaneous conversation from there. Uh, if our panelists have any point at any you know time, just please raise your hand. And, and we'll, we'll be happy to entertain it. Or even uh, if we have a lot of time, just jump in and express your thoughts. So to begin with our discussion today, uh, I'd like to, to begin with you, but uh, first, it's a two-part question. First, uh, how did the Taliban's take over of Kabul uh, you know, resonated with you? What did it remind you of? That's the first part of my question. And if it did remind you of anything, the second question uh, is, what does it tell us about the increasing US engagement in Yemen? Does it send any message? 
Uh, does it mean, you know, anything? What direction does it really take us toward? Uh, over to you, Bar. Um, there is definitely, um, I, I mean, watching the tragic events in, in Afghanistan, um, I couldn't um, help but to first of all fulfill uh, the, to empathize with the people in Afghanistan and what they're going through. Um, and second, of, co of course, is to draw uh, the, uh, the clear similarities between what was happening in Afghanistan and what happened and it still is happening in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Yemen. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the clear similarity was basically we had a, uh, a non-state uh, 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 actor, a militia, an armed group, uh, taking over the uh, capital and ending uh, what many uh, people, um, especially the, 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 the Afghans, would familiarize as, as the common rule of law, as the basic normal uh, norms of a, um, of a, uh, of a uh, civil society. We saw the trucks, armed trucks of and, and, and armed uh, groups in pickup trucks, similar to the scenes that we've seen in Sana'a. And we still see in Sana'a and the rest of the, uh, of, and many uh, different uh, parts of, um, of Yemen, uh, of, Yemen uh, of Yemen today. Those scenes um, quite quick, clearly reminded me of the events that happened in September 2014 and what happened um, later on. We had the central structure state was dissolving uh, to the benefit of an armed uh, of an armed militia. And basically the armed militia had one uh, basic uh, simple rule, who, who strong rules. If you want to take the power, come and fight me. That's the only uh, that's the only method that they were able to take uh, the control over Kabul. And uh, if anyone wants to challenge them, then uh, you're you're welcome to challenge uh, challenge them by the same by the same principle. But the second and most important is how the international community and especially U.S. policymakers were dealing with it. The problem existed right before um, the. Uh, the uh, the messages that the U.S. Uh, policymakers were sending were clearly sending to the Taliban that all what they had to do is wait and engage in a long-term uh, insurgency, and eventually they will be able to take uh, power. Um, and I would like to 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 talk. The, the 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 issue is about how how this approach, this sense of when we disengage, then we just simply um are uh, ending uh, ending wars and i'd like to quote a um a a um a, the um, a, a lieutenant general uh he's general mcmaster um in his book battlegrounds which i i, I find is fascinating because it describes a lot about us uh policy making and the thinking about us policy making when they decide uh, such such decisions that sometimes could end up to be very fatal. He said, the, the US policymakers are living in what he described as strategic narcissism. And strategic narcissism, he said, is our ten tendency to define the world only in relation to us. And therefore to assume that whatever decision, this decision we make is uh, decisive to be, uh, to uh, for it to become a, a a whether you know a favorable outcome or a or a bad or a bad outcome, strategic narcissism is flawed because it doesn't take into consideration the agency, influence and authorship over the future that others have. Because strategic narcissism doesn't consider that agency, we tend to engage in optimism bias, wishful thinking, and ultimately self delusion. We develop policies and strategies based on preference rather than what the situation demands. And there are many examples of this. And this could not be more true to how it engaged in Yemen and still is engaging in Yemen, especially with this Biden administration. It assumes that the Houthis does not have agency to affect the course of the future of the country. So simply by making a unilateral decision by the US administration that by itself is decisive to how the future will look like. 
the reality is much more complicated. And this has been the problem for, for many, many years since the beginning of the conflict that for, um, for the, 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 the campaigners in here, it's a simple answer. Either you're with war, then that's bad, or you're against war, then that's good. The reality is policy is much more complicated than that. It's not that, uh, quite, that, uh, uh, quite that simple. The Houthis are watching what, happens, what happened in Afghanistan. They're learning and they got the right message. All what they had to do is wait and keep on escalating, keep on fighting. Eventually, the US will just pressure its allies to withdraw regardless of whatever, what, what the, uh, the consequences are going to be on the ground. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bala, on, on sketching uh, an image to kick off our, our conversation today uh, by first unpacking the US mode of engagement in, in Afghanistan and the possibly reductionist uh, you know, analysis of the landscape and what its, its unilateral decision might, might lead to, at least how it seems. And, 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 and the implications uh, for, for armed non-state actors uh, in, 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 in the politics associated with it uh, at regional level, where you have implications for uh, regional strategic partners, uh, as well as local stakeholders. Uh, moving on, based on what Barat said, uh, Peter, now, you know, the Biden administration has been putting a huge emphasis on ending war discourse. What do you think that means uh, for, for the context of Yemen uh, by looking at Afghanistan? Uh, what kind of pieces is, 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 is in the making now? Uh, is it, you know, the foundations for a sustainable peace in the country or, or something else similar? to what we've seen in, in Kabul. Uh, over to you, Peter. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. I, I'd like to apologize again for being late and for having to move position. Having moved outside to get a better signal, it started raining, so it's going very well for me today. Um, I also want to thank Farah for making me actually want to read a, a book by an American former general. Um, that's a, a really great um, section that, that you read out there. To Ibrahim's question. I, I think having spoken to some, some people on, on the, the US policy making, decision making side over, over the last couple of weeks, there is a keenness there not to draw parallels between Afghanistan and Yemen in terms of the nature of the conflict. And I, I do find that, that quite difficult because I think that what happened in Afghanistan was a clear articulation of this growing sense in um, Congress, in Washington DC, in quote unquote foreign policy making circles in the United States, um, that the United States needs to disengage militarily um, as much as possible. Um, and then to, that's largely based on national interests, a fatigue with militarism, a fatigue with foreign wars and with um, Americans dying abroad and also with the, the moral implications of things like from ranging from drone strikes to occupation, so on, so forth. But what we're, we're seeing at the same time, I would argue, is that desire to just disengage a little and pivot towards Asia being retrofitted um, with this narrative that there is sort of a, a moral argument for, for doing X, Y, and, and Z. And in the Yemeni context in particular, what we're, we're seeing, of course, is this developing narrative that the, the key pathway to ending the conflict is simply to have Saudi Arabia remove itself from the, the conflict. Um, in my view, this is based on uh, an outdated understanding of the, the conflict, of the Saudis deal-making position at this moment in time vis-a-vis -vis the Houthis and the situation on the ground. In 2016, 2017, 2018, we had a, a broad equilibrium in the, the military conflict. And until the end of 2017, the Houthis had to operate 
in something broadly resembling a coalition with loyalists of the former president, Ali Abdullah Saleh, and the, the GPC. Since um, 2018, what, what we've seen is first the, the momentum of the conflict moving against the Houthis, international intervention, followed by a lack of, of follow-up. And now over the past two, three years, the balance of power and the center of gravity shifting towards the Houthis, where they increasingly feel that they can dictate the terms of an end to the conflict. And where I think this end the, the war narrative, as you described it, Ibrahim, this idea the pressure on Saudi Arabia alone is what's needed to end the conflict, becomes problematic is on two fronts. One is the assumption that the, the Saudis have sufficient leverage to get what they need to simply withdraw, quote unquote, from Yemen. And second is the idea that this is, that the primary determinant of this conflict at this point is Saudi intervention. Because what we are likely to see, in, in my view, if the Saudis were to simply, quote unquote, cut a deal with the Houthis um, and remove all military support, would be Houthi advances, um, really a, a, a prolonged period of bloodletting, frontline fighting, and then something resembling a complex insurgency um, in certain areas of the country. Um, against the, the, by that point, sort of de facto authorities in whichever parts of the country they, they controlled, and possibly a deeper regionalization of the conflict um, as other actors step in to the, the void the Saudis leave. And indeed, the Saudis continue to provide some support to certain groups to ensure that, that it's not a complete Houthi takeover and they have some, some leverage. And what we see in that context, and I'm sorry, I'll wrap up in one second, is really sort of a loss of really international influence, what little there is on the, the conflict parties and an ability to influence mediation and negotiation among Yemeni groups, because we end up in a place where maybe the, the president and the internationally recognized government are seen as sort of a non-entity. I think that the American treatment of Ashraf Ghani and the, the government of Afghanistan however much we may like or dislike them, is quite telling in, in this, this context, that it, it simply within two or three days, they said these people are now non-entities. Um, and if we were mo to move towards this um, approach that some are advocating for, and that it seems is developing towards a conclusion simply through inertia in policymaking, there is this risk that people have not fully considered the second order effects and what that means for conflict in the country, which is, of course, what I, I focus on, violent conflict, and in terms of the, the country's politics and the ability to sort of move towards some kind of, of political settlement. But what I will say in, in conclusion is that one of my core takeaways from Afghanistan is how serious um, this administration is about disengaging um, or sort of um, deleveraging itself from the Middle East, Western Asia, wherever possible, so it can focus on, on other things that it considers to be of, of greater import. Ah, thank you very much, Peter, for, for explaining the US disengagement uh, and doing an overview also of developments in Yemen and what might uh, the implications of, of, of this uh, policy mode uh, look like in Yemen, and then also the key takeaways from, uh, from you know, uh, from the take from taking down the government of President Ashraf uh, Ghani. Uh, there are of course lots of lessons to learn. Uh, but to follow up with you, Peter, on this question, and based on on the dangers that you highlighted, given the complexity and 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 also the skepticism. Or, or, or the fear of reducing uh, the ending wars discourse in Yemen by limiting it to the withdrawal of, of, of the Saudi-led coalition and, and the remaining forces. Uh, do we need a policy shift to understand the changing fluid dynamics at, at Yemen's local level in view of the you know, proliferation of armed actors who were, despite being able to make, you know, uh, uh, progress in the battlefield in, in recent months 
but also faced with uh, with multiple actors whose associate associations are are complex and with multiple regional actors. Uh, you have the Houthis on the one hand with Iran, you have uh, the the STC and and the UAE backers. Uh, you have the government of Yemen, and, and then it's uh, rather reducing support, even from the closest partners who came to uh, to aid it. Uh, in in view of this fragmentation, and also uh, you know the lessons learned from from Afghanistan, do we need a policy shift down in the United States as the U.S. you know deepens its engagement? Now we have. Uh, the U.S. National Security Advisor headed to Saudi Arabia and, and most likely to push uh, in that direction. Yeah, and this is this is what, what I find um, challenging. I, I do think that some of what I see coming out of conversations in, in Washington seems to be based again on an outdated analysis of the momentum and balance of power of the conflict. Um, we're working on something right now that attempts to kind of parse that out a little bit and show where those shifts have been over the last few years. But what I do think is important for us, those of us working on Yemen to understand is as has always been the case, Yemen policy isn't that much to do with, with Yemen. In, in many cases. It's to do with what the US perceives as its national interests. It's to do with trends in policy making. And we do have to understand that Yemen is going to be seen as a red, relatively minor um, playing piece in the risk board that is the, the Middle East and North Africa to some in, in those circles. And that it would be very difficult to shift the momentum of, of sort of the policy conversation in the United States for Yemen's sake uh, alone. And unfortunately, I, I do think those of us on the Yemen side of things do have to be clear eyed uh, about that. And I, I really struggle to see based on conversations I've been having recently, how one could, could convince people um, of an alternative strategy, um, especially given that sort of the way that that is perceived by some in Washington um, to say sort of the sort of just end the war by force pressuring the, the Saudis um, doesn't really actually sort of resolve conflict in, in Yemen. The perception can be that the alternative option is deeper American military engagement. And that's a, a very hard red line, I would say across the board, that's a pretty much bipartisan consensus. No one wants any additional involvement in the, the military component of, of the, the conflict. Um, and I think the, the thing that I and others are trying to think through is sort of how does that affect um, calculus on Yemen going forward? What are the, the realistic scenarios and what are the least bad outcomes that can be produced from a policy position? Uh, thank you, Peter. Before I jump to Adia and talk about justice and human rights, let me go back to, to Ba. Uh, in, you know, building on, on what Peter mentioned, Ba, uh, what do you think are the greatest dangers now associated with uh, the end war discourse and the messages that have been already picked up by the Houthis? Uh, you know, upon the withdrawal of or, or the revocation of the FTO early in, in, in February, we saw the Houthis intensifying their military operations, in fact, resuming a large scale military offensive towards Ma'ib. And that has been going on for the past eight months. And then again, with uh, the recent takeover of Kabul, we see another likely indication of being emboldened. And, and not only the, the Houthis, but also other actively engaged military uh, groups uh, who believe that they're not held accountable. And, and, and they so that despite, you know, a two decade kind of US military engagement and then changing good lines to the extent that the capital of Afghanistan was almost surrendered 
with, with, with the wealth of, of military capabilities there, uh, what do you think are the, greater danger, uh, the greatest dangers in Yemen and, and the policy shift that needs to factor in Yemen, as, as Peter highlighted, given that in many cases, uh, the Yemen policy is not about Yemen. It's about the vicinity of Yemen, the strategic uh, interests of the United States, global maritime security, and other considerations. Over to you, uh, I think the, uh, the 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 biggest danger is really um, uh, the um, the whole the whole the, the whole assumption when it, um, the the current administration. First of all, I'd like to 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 pressure on what um, Peter mentioned is that the this the Biden administration showed how much it's willing uh, to take very really unpredictable to decisions even while you know people were even the closest um, advisors to uh, the administration were advising that uh, this is you know the um, that quick withdrawal is gonna end up in a very uh, in in um, in chaos and and the and the dissolvement of the of the government in in, in Kabul but uh, of course how much the Biden administration how much risks they're willing to take and uh, take sudden uh, sudden decisions. The uh, the the second point which I would like to to um, uh, to add here is the, uh, the the real problem is that um, the the policy hasn't been about Yemen. So really, it's rarely that I see a policymaker is talking about what's going to happen to to Yemenis. What does the future look like to regular Yemenis? What does the future look like to the children of Yemen? Um, the thousands of people who have been who the Houthis are recruiting on a daily basis. What's going to happen to the women who are being abducted? And that's not really um, almost none the case when it comes to the to the decision making. It simply views this um, narrative that um, everything is determined just by uh, by uh, the decision of the US uh, of the US administration and uh, uh, and um, what happens as a as a as a as a result is we see um, and I think this is the biggest danger is um, we will see a situation where the uh, more governments including especially the US government will say let's deal with the reality and the reality is we have armed groups and then the armed groups becomes basically the de facto authority um, um, somehow recognized maybe to a lesser extent from one country to another but recognized by the international community so basically it's rewarding the rewarding the the takeover of uh, a of a of a uh, of a country, or rewarding the violence that has been escalating in the country by giving them more recognition, by giving them more authority, um, and 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 I think that is the uh, the main the main problem. Yes, I think people are welcome to make the assessment that maybe it is not right for the United States to to engage. It is not right for the United States to um, add uh, military power. But what should really change is the notion that um, uh, this is a you know this is a um, uh, this whole delusion that this is a a, a conflict um, that is started simply because uh, it's it's a whole conflict that primarily is on Saudi Arabia backed by the United States as if there is no other actors there's no consequence to the effect and if the United States wants to make to the arguments of isolation they're well they're welcome to uh, to uh, to do so um, but I think they they need to be telling the reality and we need to be telling we need a better job doing our job to tell the 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 whole world what's going to happen thank you very much for that uh, this is a good overview uh, of the dangers and what they might mean in the country uh, moving on from from this rather alarming overview of might unfolding Yemen, uh, we want to explore with Adia a little over accountability, human rights, freedoms, women's right, and political inclusion. Adia, 
now, you know, uh, the country is, is more than half dominated by emboldened armed actors uh, who may not care much for freedoms, women rights and political inclusion. And, and even more so after uh, the Taliban's takeover of Kabul and, and failing to do so much of you know, military breakthrough in a direction that is considered otherwise. Uh, in view of all of this, do you think the current level of accountability uh, and, 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 and international measures in that direction are adequate? Uh, do you think actors like the Houthis uh, feel emboldened that even uh, the, the current minimum of accountability measures uh, will be likely ignored? Uh, what to expect from the implications of an emboldened armed group, and not only the Houthis, but also other armed groups in the country, and so the government or the coalition, uh, including the, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and, and the United Arab Emirates. Uh, over to you, Aldea. Colonel Ibrahim, thank you. Uh, so first, uh, I just want to say uh, something about the war in Yemen. The war in Yemen has maybe three layers. We have the local players, and the local play players are different armed groups. So Yemen now is controlled by different armed groups from Sa'ada to Sokatra. And there is a huge collapse of the state because of this war. Uh, but the, the war in Yemen is not a civil war because also we have the regional layer. It's also a proxy war. So we have Saudis, Emiratis, and Iran and their allies. And the uh, third layer is the international community, and especially states who has the power to influence the whole war in Yemen, especially the UK and the US. So while talking about parties to the conflict in Yemen, it's like to think that uh, to think that the, the whole solution will come from Houthis and what they are doing, or will come from the Saudis and Emiratis and what they are doing is just like naive. And I think the United States, they know it's not only about Saudi Arabia and it's not only about airstrikes. If they decided to say this, it's just because they are planning for their own approach and purpose. Uh, especially this administration. They have been talking about Yemen through the Trump administration and they used Yemen in their elections. So when it comes to accountability, uh, accountability, it means all parties to the conflict. And we all know that now it's like a fact that there, there are no clean hands in Yemen. And when I talk about accountability, I, I talk about criminal accountability and international accountability. International, because the war in Yemen is not only civil war. It's like it needs an international mechanism. So uh, because we are in, the, in parallel with the Human Rights Council session now in Geneva, uh, and the US uh, through the last four years played a very negative role in order to have any international investigation in Yemen. And because they claim that they have a new approach now regarding Yemen, I expected, the, expected that uh, the Human Rights Council to be the first test for the US regarding accountability. Because civil society, they asked at this Human Rights Council session uh, to, they asked for creating a criminally focused investigative mechanism. So like something like IIIM, something that can build files and identify perpetrators and can, uh, it's a very serious steps, a step towards accountability, criminal accountability, and it can be done easily through the Human Rights Council. I expected the US to push strongly towards this, but they came with the minimum for asking to renew the GEE for multi there and they didn't ask. So I, 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 I consider them with a very practical step towards accountability. I, I consider them that they have failed to prove that they are serious about it in the Human Rights Council, which is still going on if they want to do something else. Um, so because using human rights violations for the political reasons, it will just give you political reasons, but it will not solve, it will not protect civilians, it will not 
make the, the crisis less in Yemen because we all know maybe because the crisis in Yemen happens because of the huge lack of accountability. So if you want really to condemn whether Houthis or Saudis and Emirates or Iran or any other parties to the conflict, go and support the international mechanisms for accountability and then we will play this role. Don't just use it for political reasons. So I ask the US from this platform to push for the, uh, uh, to support the idea of having a criminal focus uh, accountability mechanism. Uh, and it didn't happen until now. Also, the US can play a major role to, to push for refer the Yemen situation to the ICC. And this is one of the recommendations of the GEA, which is called the, uh, the, the group of eminent experts. So they can do a lot regarding the accountability lessons we are talking about um, the US, but they, but they didn't do something serious until now. Uh, thank you very much, Fadia. So you explained uh, limited inaction or in fact, lack of support to uh, some accountability measures at the Human Rights Council and including by forming you know, an independent investigation committee, as well as uh, taking you know, violations and war crimes to the ICC. Uh, and, and these are lacking you know, important steps uh, to justice and accountability. But even now as we move, you know, what if these uh, you know, steps do not make it for political consideration? And we head towards uh, a, a discussion about negotiated settlement in Yemen. How can we in Yemen at least have, you know, at, inter, at, at domestic level, uh, you know, factor in a justice-based peace approach? What are the things that we should uh, include from your perspective to ensure uh, accountability, to tame uh, armed groups who have the very minimum respect for human rights and human dignity, uh, and have adopted even further restrictions on, on, on women in, in recent years uh, and months, with the latest being in one of the villages to restrict women position of, of phones, or even the ability to work at uh, humanitarian organizations, for instance. Uh, all of these trends are alarming. And, and without having a a justice-based peace approach, it seems we're, we're headed towards a, a future that is more interactive in Yemen than any time before, at a time when the world is, is getting more connected. And as you said earlier, uh, that with COVID, the world is coming to Yemen, uh, not vice versa, that you don't need to travel as much uh, because it, we're getting more connected in, e-panels, e-discussions, a lot of e, e, e. Uh, So to pinpoint the question again, what can be included in, in a peace agreement from a justice-based perspective? So the peace agreement should, I mean, um, should not give impunity to anyone. This is the minimum. The peace agreement should focus in general about accountability, but to hold parties to the conflict, who will be sitting in the negotiation table to hold them seriously accountable, it's going to be through the international mechanisms for accountability, not through the peace table. Peace table has its own uh, dimension, and this is a lot of compromise. So that's why we as a civil society, as a human rights NGO, we see that at the time of pushing, trying to push for peace and to bring all parties to the conflict to the table, this has had nothing to do with uh, supporting uh, international mechanisms for accountability. There are many civil society locally and internationally documenting the violations, doing a lot of advocacy, and what is known in Yemen, what is happening in Yemen from parties to the conflict, all of them, all the horrible violations and war crimes as, is very well documented. And then what? It's like the second step after this is to have a real mechanism for accountability that can not only send a message to parties to the conflict, but let them know that they will be held accountable and uh, uh, like individuals even. Uh, so 
I will, I will, I will jump to from accountability to to peace and from I heard from. Um, uh, and uh, better. Um, the I guess that the U.S. Uh, new narrative regarding peace in Yemen has to have has to have a, a, a new uh, image for the future in Yemen. How do, they, how do the US uh, administration see the future in Yemen? Like small countries that is controlled by different groups and that's it? Do they think that all they want to do to disengage after being engaged in many years negatively when they want to do a new approach is to, to disengage? No. What, what about the whole, all the consequences of the war and the power they have in order to play a positive role in order to have a sustainable peace that respects Yemenis and Yemen um, and respects the fact that they were a kind of democracy in Yemen. And we used to have elections, fake elections, but elections and we, has, we used to have political parties. So, just to, to deal with Yemen as nothing of this can happen in Yemen again, democracy, law of rule, human rights, uh, and all what Yemen deserves is to keep all parties to the conflict, uh, not fighting uh, in a certain way. Uh, this is like not ending the war, but managing the war. And I'm really afraid that the US decided to manage the war in Yemen and not to end it. To end it, it means to have a very serious steps to have all parties to the conflict, push them to be in the table in order to have a political solution, a sustainable peace that is based on the rule of law and democracy and human rights uh, and freedoms. This is what Yemen deserve and this is not impossible. But if the US, because now you know parties to the conflict, they are not fighting for political power. All of them are fighting for oil and seaport. They all imagine the, the future of Yemen as they all controlling certain areas and they need only to have a source uh, of power or a, a source of income. They don't think even that they will be pushed in order to have a real state again. So does the US, how does the US see the future of Yemen? If they think that Yemen deserve and can have a sustainable peace and then all the steps that is done by the US will be different. If they think that, Yemen should stay as it is, but with not having airstrikes or front lines, then it means that the end, the war will never be ended, and it's just like managing the war will not, uh, with not ending it. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, uh, for tackling two components, one of which is tied to the peace process. Uh, to entertain some of the questions. Uh, the first question is, says it's by Faris Hamdouni. If Saudi Arabian led intervention in Yemen stepped back from the military operation against the Houthis, are we expecting a scenario similar to Afghanistan by having the Houthis advancement in most of Yemen? Uh, yeah, uh, Bala, you might go for this question. Um... <laughs> In, uh, in short, uh, yes, that's a possibility. Uh, that's very much a possibility that can, uh, that can happen. And uh, we saw what happened last week with the um, executions, what I call them really summary executions of nine individuals from Hodeida. We will see more of those. The Houthis will be willing to bring more people to public squares and execute them, quite simple and easy. Uh, and um, that's a real fear and a real danger uh, that many Yemenis are, um, uh, are afraid of. What, uh, what we need is, of course, I would second what, uh, 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 what uh, Radia mentioned, um, is more of a realism and uh, a policy uh, that is based on reality on the ground, not based on um, what the uh, what the United States uh, seem to be it's willing to do at this time, or especially it's it's a it's a, the whole policy is based on um, an, an idea that Biden can simply by himself um, end the war in uh, end the war in Yemen, which is simply not true. 
and and I think again this brings us into um, what happened in in, Af uh, in Afghanistan. The problem that happened that is happening in Yemen and and, and still in ha and happened in Yemen in 2014 that there was a collapse of the state structure, and the collapse of the state uh, structure was not tackled head on. The, the problem wasn't addressed head on that. Uh, we cannot allow armed states to keep control or to take control over regions. Any political process, any peaceful solution should look into seriously how can they disarm uh, the non-state uh, uh, non -state actors. So we can empower, again, the state institutions, the security structure, the, an, an official security structure that is bound by the Yemeni law, not by, uh, by the, uh, the laws of uh, that group or uh, or that group, and that's that's the main fear. That's the main danger that Yemen is is uh, is is uh, is facing. Uh, what happened in Afghanistan was was very similar. The state structure was collapsing, but instead of the U.S. administration tackling it, it decided to disengage. So you're fight, and 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 that's a similar problem that the Saudis are having. They're fighting in a war that they are disengaging from. And that cannot give a that cannot give them uh, a success, but cannot also cannot ensure um, uh, um, uh, stability and safety uh, in, in, inside Yemen. There needs to be more commitment from the international community if they would like to see a um, a, um, a, a a peaceful and, and political resolution to the conflict in Yemen. I think you're on mute, Brian. You're on mute. Right. Uh, thank you, Bert. Any further points on this question by any of our fellow panelists, Peter or Adia? Assuming none, uh, I would follow up with a question mentioned here. Maybe Bert could also answer it to any of the speakers. Uh, what gains, Jamil Muhammad asks, what gains has the US achieved with the Houthis taking over most of the northern parts of Yemen. As it appears, the UK let, has lost in, da, 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 da. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, let me say something quickly and then I pass it on to Peter. The US hasn't been engaged in the conflict in Yemen. There is a myth that has been going on since the beginning of the conflict, that this is a conflict uh, launched by Saudi Arabia backed by the United States and, the, and, 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 uh, and full stop. That's not the, that is not the, uh, the, uh, the case. The core issue of the problem, we have a civil war, and then at a later stage, there, there is the, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, coalition and the infighting that happened, especially between uh, Saudi Arabia and the, United Arab, uh, and the United Arab Emirates, which effectively unenabled the Yemeni government from operating effectively inside the territories they are, at least supposedly they're supposed to be in, in uh, in uh, uh, in control, so I'm not sure that the United States even care uh, at this moment, or does it have it as a priority? If the Houthis took over major northern provinces, they have a, a uh, maybe a sense of a concern if the South, if the Houthis would threaten the shipping lanes, maybe the maritime uh, lanes and the trade lanes, maybe. Um, but they can they can ensure that safety by. Uh, by uh, sending ships to the uh, to the uh, to the Red Sea, um, so I'm not sure it is a it is a priority. But I'd pass it on to Peter. Sure. Yeah, I think I'm I'm probably in, in broad agreement with that. Um, U.S. policymakers framed their response to the beginning of the conflict as reluctant reassurance, which in effect was post-Arab Spring, um, in the midst of negotiations over the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, the Saudis said, we're going to do this thing in Yemen um, in terms of their intervention into what was already um, a civil conflict. And the US said, OK, we'll, we'll give you some support to reassure you that we, we have your back somewhat, that this partnership is, is real. And what we've seen over the past almost seven years now has really been this shift, I, I would argue, towards a viewpoint in, in the US that that need for reassurance of the, the Saudis has gone, particularly post the killing of Khashoggi, congressional outcry, the general shift towards this much more hostile posture. 
towards Saudi Arabia and a general sense that the US has kind of drained itself in the Middle East for, for no real reason. Um, and something that I find equally interesting is that I would argue that the, the Biden administration has not diverged from Trump era policy, but has continued it. So after 2018, um, the Trump administration agreed with the Saudis to halt in-air refueling, started limiting some um, assistance, including intelligence sharing. And that really has just accelerated under, under Biden, rather than this being a clean break from, from the Trump administration's approach. And the Trump administration did one thing, which was impose this foreign terrorist organization designation on the Houthis, because it saw that as kind of a, a low cost thing that it could do. Um, without having to actually engage in the conflict in a, a realistic manner. So it was more symbolic than, than anything else and with an eye on probably future elections and, and relationships. But definitely what we've seen since the conflict began is this very clear trajectory um, of Yemen first being seen through the prism of the relationship with Saudi Arabia. That relationship being seen as less and less important and more and more problematic. Um, and the response being simply that, that Yemen, as this kind of subset of Yemen policy, becomes less important apart from um, counterterrorism, always the first dimension for the, the Americans, even up to now, um, to an extent, regional threats to um, trade. Um, but a, a clear sense I at this point and a fatigue, I think, with what is perceived as the, the Saudis and the, the government of Yemen's inability to get their act together and actually sort of produce something viable or negotiate their way out of the conflict. So I think sort of all these different factors have absolutely sort of created this sort of downwards trend in American interest or desire for engagement in and on Yemen. Thank you, Peter. Uh, any follow-up by any of the speakers on the point mentioned? If not, I can take uh, further questions. And, and this question, anonymous, okay. Uh, what should the, the US do moving forward? What realistic US policy moves on Yemen would be on your wish list given the current dynamics and balance of power on the ground as described? And of course, uh, the limited or the varying levels of, of leverage, uh, while the US might have, you know, uh, significant leverage on, on and Saudis and the Emiratis and the government of Yemen, uh, it likely has less to nothing on, on the Houthi. So based on that, what options Realistic options. I know, for example, Obi has been calling to replace 2216, uh, and the major skepticism around that revolves around whether any resolution is actually getting implemented since it's ink on a paper. Uh, is it a structured mode of, of peace agreement? Uh, is it something else? Uh, so the question is basically. What policy options do you wish the United States to pursue? Uh, Radia, Peter, any of you, please. And then we'll get back to Bar. Uh, OK. So the word, I didn't like the word realistic. <laughs> uh, uh, because the whole war is not realistic, and the US can do a lot. Uh, actually, that, that question is, what did they do until now, since the first day of Biden administration and, and until now, what did they do in order to push all parties to the conflict uh, to go for peace process, to real one? Um, the U.S., what, whatever they want from Yemen, whatever they think, uh, we all know that they can do a lot and they, can, they, sh they should be pushed in order to play this major role in Yemen. Uh, they can influence all parties to the conflict, including Houthis. And we should uh, we should remember that the U.S. has a very bad reputation in this war. They have a very negative uh, intervention, whether they mean it or not. Uh, 
they did it, they want it for in purpose or just to help nowadays but they have to do a lot in order to to clean their hands from what they have done uh, in yemen with the very serious steps uh, if they have been being if they have if they are balanced and dependent in their approach in yemen pushing in all parties to the conflict then they can do a lot the special the us special envoy can start to do a real engagement with all parties to the conflict and they can talk i mean all parties to the conflict when i say this i don't mean only yemenis but also saudis and emiratis and so it's like uh until now there is really nothing have been done seriously in order to change this to change the situation in yemen uh, even i mean saudis and emiratis they they uh, improved their strategies so they have now try uh, they are now trying to um, to hide behind uh, yemeni uh, groups more than before but they are still engaged even iran is hiding be be behind houthis but if houthis are very complicated and still the us can do nothing with them we have aden we have 80% of Yemen. If Aden is fine, then Yemen will be fine. But what's happening in Aden, Sana'a is not, is not fine, but Aden also is not fine, Taiz is not fine, and Marib is not fine. So the, the United Arab Emirates in purpose, they, uh, they, we, are, we, are, we all know that they encouraged having armed groups uh, against having any shape of a state in the in the in the southern governorates so they may even what is the state in aden uh they can start from there they can start for from pushing for having a real strong government with asking their allies not to interfere with uh especially the united arab emirates when it comes to to their uh armed groups loyal to them they can do a lot if Saudis are not that strong they are strong because they're, they are facing a very uh, failure, I mean, whatever they are. Uh, so the US can start to put the situation in the, in the South uh, in their mandate. So it's not like just like Houthis are not listening, Houthis are not, we cannot do anything. They can still do a lot. And Yemen is not only Sana'a and, uh, and the areas that is controlled by Houthis. Uh, many people, uh, Many people will leave to Aden if Aden is fine, even from Sana'a, from Hudayda, from Sa'da. But the fact that we would we never uh, all uh, forget that all Yemen is controlled by armed groups, multiple powers with same mandate. So to have an, an, a balanced, independent approach to push in all parties to the conflict with using all your political power, it can do a lot. There is a balance of weakness between all parties to the conflict in Yemen, and then they can push them to do something. Uh, thank you, Aliya. Before I jump to Peter, uh, you, you sketched really good points on what the US can do uh, in territories not tied to the Houthis, and, and one in which they support the rebuilding of the Yemeni government without, you know, interference, whether by coalition partners, namely, as, as you noted, the Emiratis and Saudis, but also uh, the armed groups created uh, by the former noted. And, and that's key to tackling, of course, the, the, uh, the power distribution, which you, you called in many other analysts, the balance of weakness, uh, not balance of power. Uh, and, and the second is to focus on mitigating or controlling the influence of regional stakeholders. Uh, you also noted another point that the US has influence on the Houthis. I'd be interested to ask you uh, what does, you know, what are the facets of, of leverage that the United States have on the Houthis? Uh, uh, this question to you earlier before I jump to Peter. Uh, Olivia, yeah. What you know, tools of leverage does the United States have over the Houthis? 
What does the tools of leverage they have towards Saudis and Emiratis? Did the, the Emiratis until this moment uh, withdraw their stop? Uh, I mean, withdraw their I mean, or stop playing with their armed groups in the uh, in the south? Did Saudis stop what they are doing in many many different le levels? So it's like you will have the power if you respect yourself and you are independent and balanced in your approach. So to keep asking what, what privilege they have in Houthis as they have changed the policy of Saudis and Emiratis and everything is okay, it's not, it's not tackling the, the, the war from its right angle. Because they did nothing with all their part, uh, with all uh, with all parties to the conflict. Nothing has done and put uh, uh, the US, what did they do until now? What did they push the Saudis to do? What did they push the Emiratis to do? And they can't, and they, what did they push even Houthis to do? Do, I, do they have a plan? Did they do anything? Did they try to fix their situation in any level? They did nothing. They should try first and then ask us what to do. And if they have, uh, and when I talked about accountability mechanisms, I see that uh, state actors and non-state actors, uh, actors do care about the, the, for example, the, uh, reports that came out from the, the group of eminent experts. So do they do care, they engage with it, and they listen, all of them, state and non-state actors. But it has a limit, uh, I mean, influence, because it has to be stronger. And for us as a local NGOs, if we can do some influence in the ground, whether in Sada or in Sana'a or in Aden or in Taiz, if we can push parties to the conflict sometimes to release detainees or to stop doing a certain violation, then what can an international community do? If we can have some influence and we are one NGO, then what can the international uh, community uh, do if they decided to do? But the US did not, did until, not, until now, they did nothing. Uh, thank you. Uh, although that doesn't answer the question, I'll have to move on to Peter. Uh, Peter, do you have any thoughts on, on the same question, which basically talks about, you know, realistic uh, or practical ways that one would wish the US uh, to move forward? And of course, the question uh, that Adia didn't answer, I'd love to have an answer because it, no one has a clear answer about it, uh, including myself, on what tools of leverage does by the uh, way i answered in my own way <laughs> uh, thank you uh, and 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 you know tim blender king has been shuttling eight maybe nine times and and this is just mm -hmm. this week he has another visit with with jake sullivan national security advisor and, and a team with him and they've been talking for the past couple of months over uh you know ideas around the joint declaration or what the Saudis later branded as uh, the Saudi initiative. So there have been back and forth discussions and we had uh, the Iranians present in Oman. We had, in fact, the former foreign minister Zaif going again. And then uh, multiple diplomats have noted a change or even a more, uh, a more urgent or inflexible position uh, that puts or, or delayed reaching any, any uh, ceasefire direction. And then we had the Omani facilitation. There have been multiple efforts that have been moving in place, but met with absolute inflexibility, uh, ignited military offensive that's now expanding in Shabba with, with the Houthis making uh, territorial advances there. Then view of that and, and the sign that these are not going to change or be halted after eight months. What are the realistic uh, policy options we have and tools of leverage uh, on, on the Houthis as well as other actors. Over to you, Peter. Thanks, Ibrahim. And this is where I think I, uh, I may run up against some disagreements with, with other panelists and Ambara in particular, but I look forward to the, the conversation. Um, I, I saw a, a pretty senior government of Yemen official just a, a few days ago. Um, and we had the same conversation I've been having with the, the guys in that camp for, let's say, a, a number of, of years about what it, it would mean for the government to have a stronger negotiating position vis-a-vis -vis the Houthis, 
if it had all of the or the majority of key Yemeni groups on the ground working against the Houthis under its umbrella and, and within its, its coalition. And the one of the, the core problems we, we face when we ask this question about um, realistic policy, and I, I love that phrase, balance of, of weakness, is that what was left of kind of national state structures that exe exited the, the country at the beginning of the conflict um, have really been degraded. Um, and there is a perception, not entirely accurate, that the government kind of sits outside of, of Yemen and occasionally visits the local authorities, but is disconnected from day-to-day -day governance on the ground. Um, again, that's not entirely accurate, but it, it certainly isn't inaccurate either. And we have these clusters of local capacity, not just in terms of armed groups, but in terms of local governance authorities, which are actually doing pretty positive things and are doing them autonomously to fairly autonomously from the national government. And the, the challenge has, has been for some time that if the government were able to sort of persuade to bring those groups under its, its umbrella, it would have a much stronger and more credible bargaining position vis-a-vis -vis the Houthis. But the problem is that the, the longer the conflict goes on and the more disconnected the government appears to be, the harder it is to make the argument that this is the way forward. And now people are saying, again, we're going to try and make the government more inclusive. We're going to try and bring local groups in under our umbrella, including and up to the STC. But my, my personal view is, is not, as some suggest, we just get rid of and say there is no, no government. There are a lot of sort of legal um, and, and technical strategic mediation reasons for not doing that. But what I do think is that we need to be realistic about who not just the key military centers of gravity are in Yemen, but political governance centers of, of gravity are in Yemen and find a way to integrate their perspectives, their voices, their goals and their agendas into national level mediation. Um, now that can be directly through direct inclusion within what the UN would call the track one process. And it can be all through, also through other ancillary UN based mechanisms. I think if we, we do this in a, a smart way, what we end up with is the government in a position where it feels pressured to actually do that coalition building and the Houthis in a position where they realize that they're not going to be, if they ever negotiate, negotiating just with a government that is not seen as being particularly credible or representative and which they can take an absolutely maximalist approach with and to sort of incentivize that Yemeni Yemeni deal making that we're all very familiar with and um, the crisis group my organization has been making this argument for for quite some time the problem is that this would require a new international approach which the US could, could push into i begin to wonder whether we're too late even to make that push given the houthis current sense of their own position of, of power on, on the ground. But certainly continuing with the current international model of mediation, which is to try and get the, the Houthis on the one hand and the government on the other hand, really with a, a de facto Saudi veto over whatever the Saudi decides as being problematic. And I, I worry that if we keep on waiting for the government to somehow magically regenerate itself and become a, a credible body again, then we, we end up waiting for a very long time and facts on the ground absolutely overtake that, that reality. So again, sort of if, if I have told the, the US that I think a new international approach to, to mediation to incentivize intra-Yemeni deal-making and conversation is important. Shielding that off somewhat from the, the regional influence, also quite important and some kind of international working group or contact contact group structure so that all the, the key regional international players are sitting regularly in a room with the UN and having a conversation about how this process is going and where they can apply pressure. And the final point I'll make, and I apologize for speaking at length, is one of face-to-face -face talking relationship building between the UN, other sort of diplomatic entities and all the key actors on the, the ground up to and including the, the Houthis. And the constant complaint we've heard from the Houthis and, and others 
is that previous UN envoys have spent at most 48 hours in Sana'a. They've sought to see one or two people within the, the movement, and then they've, they've left after delivering really just talking points, key messages, and generally in diplomacy and mediation with a group that has the, the complexity that the Houthis do, you would want to build relationships more widely and over a longer period. And I do think that getting people into Sana'a to talk to the Houthis on a regular basis is not a panacea, does not fix the problem, and can absolutely be um, posed as something that doesn't give them legitimacy in any way, shape, or form. And you can bolster that point by having those same people travel within Yemen, go to Taz, go to Marib, go to Aden, go to Mukalla, go to wherever you like, to see these key groups and start doing that face-to-face -face talking, relationship building with the people who, it would appear, are going to be actually the key voices in determining Yemen, Yemen's future, rather than those outside of, of the, the country. Um, uh, and I'm looking very forward very much to hear, hearing what Barra has to say. You can go, Barra. Yes, so um, while I agree with most of the points, the main issue has, um, has been, yes, I think it is important to have a more inclusive government, and I think uh, this is one of the areas that the United States can help with, uh, because um, as Radia rightfully mentioned also, the role of the UAE has been to have a dysfunctional government that is unable to operate and created circumstances in Aden and in several southern provinces um, that is basically unwelcoming for any government to, uh, to work. Um, now, one way to address this is yes, to have a more inclusive government, but then at the same time, you need a level of engagement from the US and administration that pressure the United Arab Emirates to stop any form of uh, meddling that is affecting the presence of the government. At the end of the day, as also Peter mentioned, the local governments and the local authorities have established some form of good work. But of course, they still need a lot more support. And that's where the United States can help. You need to have a more functioning, functioning uh, local authority, really the state institutions supporting the existence of the state institutions. So you can have pockets of stability in other parts of, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, um, uh, of Yemen. Um, and uh, would, uh, would uh, basically encourage uh, something different. They encourage something different to move in a different uh, in a different di direction. The problem what happened so far is they the especially with the SCC they want to be included in the in the negotiating table, which is a fair um, a fair request, but not willing to uh, cooperate. Similar like what happened with the Houthis after September 2014, uh, to cooperate with the military and security arrangements. So. Um, not just having a political seat on the table, they also want to have a veto on the ground as like the power on the on the ground and effectively basically blocked the um, the government from uh, from operating inside uh, inside um, uh, inside Aden. The problem if you go with this current status and then say like let's do just a mixture of a negotiating team with with the current situation on the ground, you will have a dysfunctioning negotiating team unable to reach decisions because at least with the current negotiating team, you know that there is a one source of power. At least Mayn Abdul Malik can make a decision. At least he was able to influence things in a one way or another. He can talk and meet directly with Hadi. That will be gone because you will have a dysfunctioning team and then you, do, you don't just have the, 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 the Saudi veto, you would have the UAE veto. And then the more you add to that mix, then more and more vetoes. It will become just a, a dysfunctional negotiating team negotiating with the with the uh, with the Houthis. What you need is that while you need a more inclusive government and a more inclusive representation to uh, to uh, to the negotiating uh, negotiating table, uh, there needs to be concessions on the ground. While we give you political inclusion, uh, pol uh, a political table, a political seat you need to give concessions on the ground. This is, I think, the, 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 uh, the approach that the United States can have enough leverage on the United Arab Emirates to deliver, to actually deliver, so that people can, uh, can 
can can feel there is there is at least something uh, something something different. And the main point is whenever we say we want the government to start operating from the ground, because simply um, what will happen if Hadi uh, passed away tomorrow? No one knows. And you have to be ready. If you don't have institutions on the place, if the government is not on the ground, the parliament is not on the ground, and the whole institution is basically absent, it will create chaos. And I think this is what this is one area, one clear area um, that the United States can 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 easily uh, can easily help with. But it needs political determination. It needs a political will within the administration to take that bold step. Thank you, Ba. Uh, we have 12 minutes left for our fascinating discussion today, which has you know, an array of opinions and ideas. And building on the original discussion that you just highlighted, the role of the UAE, what can uh, the United States do to strengthen the government's camp, which is actually an idea that was at the core of, of priorities two years ago when the Riyadh agreement was concluded in, in November 2019. Yet two years later, uh, we have more complexities and challenges than even then. Uh, nothing has been diffused to, to, to fairly characterize what's been happening since. Uh, there are two questions here by our audience. One is by Alf, uh, Alf Ahmed, and this is to Annie. He says, do you think that the realistic approach uh, to the UAE is to stop its intervention in Yemen? That's one. Uh, another question related uh, to the best alternative to, uh, what is the Houthis best alternative to a negotiated agreement? Uh, or what would incentivize the Houthis to negotiate given the military momentum at the moment uh, in view of just, you know, uh, political rhetoric, you need a ceasefire, uh, you need to put an end to this, condemnations. So these are two questions. You are muted, Ibrahim. Thank you, Adia. Uh, the first is, should the, UAE own be, uh, the UAE's intervention be seized in full? And, and the second, what is uh, the least bad alternative and what you know, could incentivize the Houthis to actually make concessions as, as, as well have highlighted in view of uh, them having a perceived upper hand due to the opponent of, of, due to the weakness of their opponent, the UAE, and then the, some incentives. Uh, anyone can really tackle any of the questions. I can tackle what's in my mind. Uh, there is a very ugly fact about the war in Yemen now that local parties, whether the government, the Houthis, the STC, they don't own the, this, this, their decisions to the extent that never happened before in Yemen. It's uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. They engaged even in the details of the decisions of these groups. This should be in mind while talking about any peace approach or peace negotiations. To deal with the Yemeni uh, political parties to the conflict as they, are, they, they do on their decision, uh, or they are independent. It's not uh, uh, with ignoring that they really listen to these regional powers will not let us do anything. So if there is a real pressure, it should be on local groups whether a government or armed groups through their regional allies, which is Iran, uh, the United Arab Emirates and Saudis with, uh, and I, I'm with all what Peter said about the, uh, having like uh, more negotiations among the Yemenis themselves, but with putting this fact in their mind. When I talk about the government and the situation in the South, I don't talk about it as like how to face Houthis. It's just how to help people live, how to help people survive. We want a shape of a state that help people to have a shape of life until we uh, reach a sustainable peace in the future. There is no alternative than whether a sustainable peace uh, that is based on democracy and rule of law 
or we, we will have armed groups that will be fight forever. There is no alternatives. This is what, you, what should be pushed for. And, um, the, and all parties to the conflict should be part of the peace process, all of them. Otherwise, we will be in this rubbish forever. Thank you, Aldea. Any other points by Ba or Peter? Um, what what I would what I would um, uh, what I would add is um, the um, um, uh, the reality on the ground um, is something that the Houthis have understood for quite a long time, and um, they, from their experience, is uh, simple simply is um, they have felt they are given what they want when they take more territory. The more territory they take, the more they will get on the negotiating table. They haven't been pressured to a point that they need to give concessions, otherwise they're gonna lose. Unfortunately, there was that chance with Fodeida, but because of the negative intervention by the United Nations at the time and the international community, uh, the Yemenis lost that leverage. The, you need to turn the tide so the Houthis would feel that if they don't give concessions, they're going to lose even more. Um, and um, that is possible. Uh, and, and I said it had happened uh, uh, before, but because of the, uh, of the um, uh, lack of uh, understanding of the local, of the of really of the dynamics on the ground, the intervention by the international community backfired. Um, so this is the threat is that don't reward people for escalating or adding uh, to the violence. That's that's the first uh, thing. The second thing is with the United Arab uh, Emirates. I think it's the big elephant of, uh, in the room, and everyone has spoken about it for quite a long time. There is a real agreement if there if if there is a will to do a political uh, deal with the SEC. If that's the only if that's the only problem, the reality is like uh, Radia mentioned. Uh, the United Arab Emirates have created conditions on the ground that make it impossible for any governing authority, any governing authority, to operate inside uh, inside Aden, and that needs to change. There is no like, there's no other alternative. That has to change. Thank you very much. Uh, there are multiple questions, but due to time constraints, I'll not be able uh, to to pinpoint them. And because we're reaching like the last five minutes, uh, I would like to give our panelists here today to share any conclusive remarks on their suggestions for the way forward or anything that you know was not framed within any of the questions. Uh, ladies first. So let me begin with Odia. Thank you. Uh, so first, adding to what I said that uh, the STC make it very difficult for the government to function. And also we have uh, an Islah party and their armed groups in uh, Marib and Taiz. So it's the fact that Yemen is controlled by different armed groups. Uh, the very realistic ask I want to ask the US at this moment is to, to seriously support the accountability mechanisms. One chance is now through the Human Rights Council. Second chance is the, uh, through the Security Council. It's going to make a lot, uh, a lot of difference in the lives of Yemenis. So if this war has stopped now or it take time, at least the situation will be less miserable for civilians. They will protect, be protected to some level uh, to, to be able to survive the whole complications that the war has created, which is very common sense, until we reach a sustainable peace. Thank you, Odia. Peter? Sure. Um, it's not a very positive note to end on, but my, my concern right now is that policy responses to Yemen have by and large been behind the curve of the actual trajectory of the, the conflict. And I would say that until the end of 2019, there was the possibility, if not the opportunity, to find some kind of political settlement to end the war that 
would not have been zero sum. That would not have been about one group being the most powerful, but would have necessarily involved um, leaving some of the, the status quo intact and attempting to, to shift the, the dynamics through politics. My, my concern right now is that some of what people are waiting for are things that are very clearly, or to, in my view, clearly not going to happen. If we wait for another five years, for the government to become a, a credible and meaningful actor inside the country so that everyone falls under its authority. We may, may be waiting until the government no longer has any credibility at all. If people are waiting for the US to change policy and militarily intervene, I think they're going to be waiting for a very long time indeed, given the way that policy cycles work in, in the United States. And I, I begin to wonder if at the moment where we're in the, the last moments of an opportunity to move towards some form of inclusive political settlement that does include all these groups that, that people don't like very much, and we're moving towards a new phase of the war where um, the Houthis in particular are able to take a much more zero-sum expansionist approach than at any other point in, in the conflict. And I won't dwell on missed opportunities in the past, but I, I will say that I understand skepticism of the idea of least bad outcomes. Um, but we shouldn't at this point in time, let perfection be, be the, the enemy of the done. And I don't think that means abandoning justice or a desire for a rule of law or even democracy, but it does require taking a longer view on um, conflict resolution um, and, and peace, peace building. Um, I know it's not a, a popular view, but I really hope that in another two years, we're not back on this, this same panel, having an even gloomier conversation. And that has been the trajectory of uh, conversations that all of us have had for the past seven years. Thank you, Peter. I remember last year when we shared the panel and nothing, on, on ceasefire has been happening and, and even the situation is worse now. So, so you have a point. Uh, moving on to Barak. Um, what I would finally say, because we, in, in this discussion, we're talking about the, the Biden administration specifically, is uh, simply um, all of the other groups, uh, armed groups inside Yemen, were looking very closely into what happened in Afghanistan. And that gave them some brilliant ideas into how to operate and how to react. Um, the uh, the uh, assumption of whoever is the policymaker inside the United States should always put in mind that um, they're not just waiting for the US and then react. Those are groups that have agency to affect the course uh, uh, and affect the situation on the ground. And they are doing that constantly. And we're seeing what's happening in Marib, and we're seeing what's happening in Shabwa. Just by demanding and issuing statements by the Biden administration doesn't mean that the Houthis will stop. Um, so what I would uh, what I would conclude is 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 by those two uh, simple uh, uh, simple points. Thank you very much for for these different points. Uh, today we talked about. Uh, the implications of the U.S. withdrawal of Afghanistan, or what some called the handover of Kabul, uh, with with the wealth of arms that were investments to support democracy there, as claimed. Uh, and there are key takeaways that our uh, esteemed panelists highlighted. So among the things. Uh, the three of them highlighted, or at least two, mainly of the Yamba, is that the United States can exercise high influence and pressure on its regional partners to strengthen the government of Yemen, uh, build a model which is lacking in Aden, and, and, and that's key. The second point that Adia suggested is for the United States to support, uh, you know, accountability measures at the Human Rights Council. Uh, 
The third is, of course, uh, by Peter, is to look into the realities on the ground and, and try to, to balance between competing priorities in, in the quest to end the conflict. And, and with all these uh, ideas come the questions of, of whether can the international community contribute to sustainable, long-term and just peace in Yemen. Uh, we've talked also about uh, the possibility of including accountability and justice in, in, in the peace design and, and clearly uh, with the proliferation of armed actors, these couldn't be even more important. Uh, what, what the past told us about peace agreements in Yemen is that you can sign, walk away and do whatever. And then you have multiple statements that actually change nothing on the ground. And for us to see, you know, different results, uh, the you know, needed policy shifts. Ones that factor in the domestic situation in Yemen, uh, the legitimate aspiration of the Yemeni people after uh, seven years of, of, of bloody conflict, a decade since the Arab Spring. And of course, uh, there's no way to conclude this uh, fascinating conversation uh, unless by thanking our fellow panelists for their time, honest opinions, and, and, and really good ideas. And I also take this opportunity to thank uh, our audience for the engagement. Many questions, some of which I couldn't actually ask due to time shortage. And with that, I bring this panel to an end. Thank you very much for tuning in and have a great rest of the day hoping that peace comes into Yemen sooner than expected. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining YPC's panel. Thank you.